Okay, so we've talked a little bit about sort of principles of um, ethical behavior in research. Um, today we're going to talk about some of the, the legal restrictions, at least as they apply in the United States, um, and, and legal rulings around um, research and, and the conduct of research. And we'll start that conversation um, with institutional review boards. And so institutional review boards are sort of oversight boards that are created um, by universities and other public entities, mostly hospitals, um, that receive money for research in some way from the federal government. And so um, there's two important pieces there. Right? If, you, if you receive money from the federal government, you might need to set up a research an institutional review board, but only if that money is for research purposes. And so if you get a grant to run a program, that doesn't necessarily require an institutional review board, but if that grant is for research, something to the National Science Foundation or the National Institute of Health, then you're going to need a um, institutional review board to provide oversight of human subjects research, right? Research involving human beings, um, and that can be medical research or it can be behavioral research. And this is something that emerged out of the National Research Act of 1974. Um, that sort of moment in which this emerges, uh, there's a couple things that sort of come together all at once. Um, one of those is that we have a lot of those scandals of, of um, research ethics that we talked about um, in the earlier discussion, um, Zimbardo and Milgram and the Tuskegee syphilis studies, but it also comes at a moment when the Nuremberg trials are winding down, the top Nazi leadership has been prosecuted, and the Nuremberg trials are pivoting to um, crimes against humanity committed by medical doctors experimenting on prisoners and, and other vulnerable populations. And so there's a recognition sort of in the public consciousness at the same time that these sort of horror stories are playing out in the news um, that research raises some real ethical concerns and requires some level of, of oversight. And so um, the idea of an institutional review board is that it's going to be a serious check against unethical research practices. Um, and there's a couple pieces that go into this, right? So if an institution isn't providing oversight through an institutional review board, it can lose its access to funding, which for you know, hospitals that conduct research and universities is a, is a serious concern. Um, and also through this process, there's the idea that the good ethical principles will be filtered down to individuals um, because you're expected to get training for uh, through your institutional review board. And for a long time for this class I actually required students to go through that training. Um, and then I think people kind of noticed that I was sending a lot of folks through that training process and UND pays per student. And so um, I kind of, for the sake of budget consciousness, decided not to, to, to build a university for that piece, but there is a training. And if you do end up conducting research, um, UND will ask that you go through and complete that training. Okay, so let's talk about some key principles um, that go into institutional review boards um, and what they look at and what they try to uh, support or enforce. And a lot of this overlaps with what we talked about last class period or last discussion with um, sort of general principles of, of research, right? So do no harm. We talked about that, that the idea is that you you should be trying to minimize or reduce or eliminate um, unnecessary risks or um, danger to subjects, right? Secondly, you should have um, voluntary participation, right? Should be part of that idea that you don't coerce people into participation in studies. They should be able to volunteer in. And if there are risks, that people are appropriately compensated for those risks. Um, full disclosure and informed consent are very important. People should know what they're getting into um, and should be able to consent to that fully with that full round of information. Again, this is why if you're using deception, it's not that you can't, it's that you have to, you're suddenly in that legal and ethical gray area where you have to be able to sort of make the case that this is a reasonable thing to withhold from people and that it's not going to jeopardize their ability to um, make an informed decision about the risks and potential benefits of the study. So informed consent is a, is a critical part of, of ethical research as defined under um, IRB protocols. Um, privacy and careful data management, you know, we've talked about that, the idea that data management and anonymity are you know, the sacred responsibilities of researchers to ensure. Again, that's a big thing for um, institutional review boards. And then professional conduct. And we, we touched on this a little bit, the idea that you, know, you, you run your studies um, professionally, you don't do things sloppily, um, you try to get the maximum good out of um, the research that you're doing. Again, that comes through here. Um, and again, the idea is, with this is to assure ethical behavior by researchers who are getting public funds, right? And that makes sense from the perspective of 
um, you know, democratic accountability, right? The, the general public wants to have some assurance that if it's providing money for research, that that money is being used in a way that's at least not unethical. Um, I think that's a reasonable thing for society to ask. Um, but it also plays a role of protecting institutional entities, right, from unethical behavior of individuals, right? This is a way for um, institutions to say, this was a proposal, we vetted it, we cleared it, you were trained, you know what you're supposed to do. If there's a problem, it's not on us, the institution, it's on you, the researcher, who violated these rules and these procedures. Um, I should flag some of the special protections that come with um, institutional review boards and, and the whole um, framework around it. Um, so if you are conducting research on minors, I, people under the age of 18, um, folks who have maybe mental impairments that uh, inhibit their ability to provide informed consent or maybe to evaluate risk in a, uh, a reasonable way, um, or if you're working with prisoners, um, any of those populations, those vulnerable populations, um, are going to get additional scrutiny from an IRB. Um, I guess I should also flag that um, women who are pregnant also um, fall under this vulnerable category, um, but that doesn't typically um, apply in the social sciences. That's more sort of the medical fields where you're stabbing people with needles and injecting them with things um, that you might wanna pay special attention to um, fetal development. In the social sciences, survey questions rarely have an effect on, on fetal development, and so we don't typically consider that to be a vulnerable population. But minors, those with mental impairments, prisoners, that population has suffered at the hands of social scientists over the years, and therefore there is this additional scrutiny. And I think a good rule of thumb is that if you as a researcher are in a position to manipulate somebody, to coerce them, um, that that kind of population, that that kind of relationship requires a high level of scrutiny um, to make sure that ethical behavior is, is being carried out. Um, and as I said, this is not sort of random speculation or this could be the source of bad things happening. These populations have been abused by researchers in the past and so we have special protections. Um, there are some exemptions, so not all research conducted at universities or hospitals that receive federal funds um, are required to uh, go through an IRB approval process. Um, so food and beverage tasting is generally exempt, um, I think within reason, as it blurs into this is medicine, um, you might start raising some eyebrows and require IRB approval. Um, research based on existing data is exempt. So the University of North Dakota subscribes to a online um, re data repository called ICPSR, the Institute for Social and Political Research. I maybe missed a letter in there. Um, and that has archives of tens of thousands of studies. You can go on to ICPSR and download any of that data and do any analysis you want on it. And you don't have to contact IRB or let them know because that data already exists. You're not conducting research on human subjects. You're conducting research on a data set that was already created that may have been conducted by doing human subjects research, but that's not, you have no ethical control over that. Like you, you have to, um, assume or defer to the ethical protocols that were followed by those researchers. Um, research on public policy by government for purposes of policy evaluation is exempt. So if you are a government entity and you wanna know if a program is working and you're conducting research and money has been set aside in a budget to do that, that might technically fall under the rules of the 1974 science act, which I really should memorize the name of. Um, yes, but that's an exempt um, area because the public has an interest in having research conducted on public policy and done in, in a regular way by the government. Um, and then finally, there's a whole class of things that are largely exempt um, educational instruments. So I can administer a test in this class or a quiz. And even though that looks like human subjects research and that I'm you know, making you answer questions, um, it's not, it's exempt. Um, because it's for educational purposes. Surveys um, kind of fall into a gray area where they may exist or they or may be exempt or may not be exempt depending upon um, your IRB and depending upon the 
accreditation that your IRB participates in um, and whether or not they have sort of a let us know, fill out this one page check sheet um, that confirms that there's no risk to human subjects so that the risk is um, minimal and that you're going to follow um, standard um, you know, data management protocols to ensure data is left confidential. It might be a very simple process of just check these boxes or it might receive full scrutiny. Again, um, it really depends on the IRB, different IRBs interpret the law and set different thresholds for, for what they do um, in different ways. Um, yeah, and then I should also say uh, public observation. So if you're just sitting in a park and taking notes, um, you may not need IRB approval, depending on your IRB. I would double check that. Again, different IRBs interpret that particular exemption differently. Um, and then the interactions of public officials should be completely exempt um, from IRBs that, that as part of democratic accountability, um, that we're not trying to restrict the ability of researchers to study public officials and what public officials are doing and saying. Um, but again, different IRBs interpret that differently. Um, so. And then lastly, I'll throw out that there's a bunch of other sort of legal frameworks that uh, researchers need to be aware of and potentially navigate. Um, and so if you are working in an educational institution, you may need to pay special attention to anonymizing data related to students. Um, I would assume that basic data protocols um, to anonymize data um, should help meet the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act 1974, which also says basically um, universities and schools need to be very careful with sharing data and limiting who can have access to data about students, about whether they're attending um, schools and about their grades. Um, but again, it might be worth um, looking into the details of that closely if you're working in an educational institution and your research is involving students. Um, there's also the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, um, which is pronounced TIPA, which sometimes gets misunderstood as the health Information Privacy Act, which is nothing that exists. Um, this is something that was created as part of healthcare reforms to, to allow people to sort of um, transition between health insurance companies um, and put in some protocols about how hospitals can and cannot share data. So this has nothing to do with whether your employer can ask you about health status or whether you're allowed as a researcher to ask um, you know, in a survey question about vaccination status. This has everything to do with hospitals, those healthcare entities that are collecting data and just making sure that they're being secure with that data that they're using in a way that you've approved of and that you're informed about. Um, so that's another one to pay attention to. Again, if you're working in a healthcare environment, it, it's worth maybe, you know, digging in and looking a little closer about into that. Um, and then lastly, there's um, the can spam um, law from 2003, which is weirdly named, but basically puts restrictions on um, the use of email addresses for commercial purposes, which includes research, um, emailing people surveys. Um, the basic idea is that you shouldn't be able to email somebody unless you have um, a pre-existing sort of connection with them um, or for non-commercial purposes is generally um, acceptable. Um, most um, universities and their IRBs have interpreted that as you can't conduct surveys unless you have um, some sort of approval from folks to be able to include them in that survey. And so there are survey companies that have lists of sort of potential candidates who, who've opted in and said, yes, I'm happy to receive surveys and you can route your surveys through these companies for a fee to a pool of people who've opted in and have agreed to take surveys. Um, or you can, um, email people, again, depending on your IRB, always chat with your IRB folks because they have their own interpretation of things. Um, but you might be able to email folks if the email if emails are posted on sort of an official website, right? So if you're looking at cities and the city administrator's email address is listed there, you might be able to grab that email address from that web page and email that person a survey because they've they're operating in an official capacity. But again, I'm basing this on my experiences working with University of North Dakota's IRB and different IRBs interpret things differently because they're all trying to navigate the same basic puzzle. They want to create a framework in which the institution is not going to be 
guilty or vulnerable of doing something unethical that's going to you know catch the eye of, uh, of a newspaper or a cable news program they also don't want to jeopardize their funding and so they sort of tend to look at whatever the bar is legally and then try to go a couple steps above that to try to anticipate or cut off any potential um, unanticipated or unexpected scenario. And as a result, um, it, it's something of a negotiation with local institutions, what those lines actually are, particularly as new technologies come online. You know, a number of years ago, um, it wasn't even possible to do an email survey. And now I think that's a, a very standard way in which most polling firms um, conduct at least part of their, their um, polling. And so IRBs are sort of navigating these things on the fly and trying to figure out what what complies with existing rules and how to make that work in practice.